Now, a lot of supplements, a lot of probiotic supplement companies out there will talk about why their probiotics are good because they've got prebiotics in them. And I guess, you know, without really understanding or looking at the research, it, for most people, it would make sense. Hey, if you've got probiotics, they're going to need to feed prebiotics in the supplement. That just makes sense. Now they're going to have some fuel so they can grow. And, you know, with the idea that they are recolonizing in the gut. Right. What does the research say about that? Yeah. And that's also something that I generally thought was true. Uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the literature here is you see that low FODMAP diets, especially for people who have gastrointestinal symptoms, are very beneficial. And so the low FODMAP diet, by definition, being low prebiotic, mm. it makes you start to think. And we recently reviewed the evidence on this. And for IBS, I was actually surprised to see, but recent meta-analyses, you know, summaries of clinical trials found no benefit for IBS with prebiotics, which again, I thought was surprising because I thought there would be at least some benefit. Now, so that's for IBS and that's a good sort of hallmark condition. I think that encapsulates a lot of gut symptoms. A different meta-analysis did find that probiotics with prebiotics was helpful for inflammatory bowel disease. So I'd say, okay, IBS, maybe not. IBD, maybe. Now, probably the best evidence for prebiotics is for metabolism, for lowering blood sugar and cholesterol. Uh, the effects aren't huge, although for blood sugar, they're, they're substantial. Um, however, the dosages used are high enough to lead to adverse events gastrointestinally in a notable subset of individuals. Hmm. So, you know, the, the, the hypothesis that prebiotics make the probiotics work better, I don't think is correct. I think that was a, a good theory, but as I look at these data, you know, I, I kind of question how true that is. Should you or should you not use them conjunctively? I think it depends. You could try. I don't think it's going to um, make a big difference. Although uh, I know we're going to talk about zonulin, and I was also surprised to see when a meta analysis looked at the impact of probiotics and symbiotics, meaning the combination of probiotics with prebiotics on zonulin, they found that there was a favorable impact. But when they did a regression analysis, they found that the probiotics were, were beneficial for reducing zonulin, but the probiotics with prebiotics, the symbiotics, did not have a favorable impact on zonulin. So collectively, I say, you know, it, it's hard to be black and white on this because there's some mixed data. I would lean away from the use of prebiotics. If you want to try them, just do an isolation. So start your probiotic alone first, give that maybe a month or two, get to a point where you feel you've leveled off. Oftentimes with a new therapeutic, there's going to be this gradual gain and then a leveling off point. So wait until you're at that leveling off point. You know, Don't rush because I'm sure people can relate to this. It's common that people will say, I'm not really sure. right? I started something else. I was traveling. So you're, you know, you're trying to figure out, does this therapy help me? You want to reduce variables as much as you reasonably can. So probiotics first. And then once you feel like you've leveled off, then in isolation, try a prebiotic. If you get a good signal, keep going. If you don't stop with one caveat that the first week or so on prebiotics, there can be some increased gas and flatulence as the microbiome adjusts. So don't jump ship too quickly. Give it about a week and then reappraise. If it's beneficial, keep going. If it's not, I would stop. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and really helps people kind of understand how to use it. So you start with probiotics first and then kind of after taking them for a month or two, your body's adapting them, then potentially try the prebiotics, add that in. And I know for different individuals, they're going to respond better to different types of prebiotics. I know for me, in general, I respond really well to eating certain foods that tend to have a lot of prebiotics in them. But then when I take like a, a resistant starch or like a supplement that, you know, is kind of marketed for gut health, it seems to give me just a lot of, a lot of gas and bloating. A lot of those same types of fibers are in things like avocados, which I, I do well with. Uh, however, I, you know, and this just happened the other day, somebody, uh, a company sent me a coffee creamer, you know, it had all this great ingredients in it, rhodiola, MCT oil powder, all this kind of stuff. And I do well with MCT oil powder, do well with rhodiola. 
but it had resistant dextrose in there, right? And it was kind of marketed as, hey, it's going to support your, you know, give you better energy. It's going to support your gut. And I, I put a little bit of that in. I was like, oh, I'll try this. I put it in, actually in my in a smoothie. Mm. And I just had terrible bloating afterwards. And so it was just kind of like this resistant starch, this resistant dextrose. So you kind of have to watch and see how your body responds to each thing. Um, and I was interested also, you had mentioned how with IBS, the prebiotics showed that there was an improvement, but with the IBD, irritable bowel disease, so you have IBS, which is kind of a, a, a clamorate of, of different symptoms, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. IBD would be an actual disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Right. It showed there, there was some improvement. What do you think the mechanism potentially, obviously that, that needs to be sussed out with more research, but what do you think a potential mechanism would be that you know, why IBS, somebody may not respond as well based on that research versus IBD. Well, I also wonder, you know, even further upstream, is this maybe an artifact of data limitation? And as more yeah. research comes in, we'll see that that's not actually the finding. Um, I also wonder if perhaps because most IBD, not all, but there's definitely a, a skewing toward the majority, whether it be Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, occurs in the colon. And that's where I think you can make a case for the prebiotics being more important, whereas more IBS is occurring in the small intestine. And that's where I think feeding the bacteria can be more dicey and the immune system modulation is probably more important. That would be how I speculate. Um, but who knows, right? Speculation, you know, is yeah. uh, <laughs> always a, a coin toss. Like I could be right. I could be wrong. You know, we'll know in a couple of years, probably. I think that's really interesting. And I think that's an important consideration is a lot of these symptoms, a lot of symptoms are related to people having challenges with their small intestine, right? Just the integrity of the gut lining there, the overall uh, bacterial levels, microbial levels, microbial load in the small intestine versus people that are having issues more large intestine based. And the people that are on that are having more of the small intestinal based issues tend to do better with that low FODMAP or in a sense, low fiber, low prebiotic diet. They tend to do a lot better with that versus the people you know, with more large intestine, they actually tend to do better with higher fiber, right? Um, and that's why, you know, you'll have people that market, hey, you got to be on this really high fiber diet to overcome constipation, to reduce your risk of colon cancer, right? Meanwhile, you know, there's other people that are like, well, I, I can't handle the fiber because I get bloated, I get, you know, gas, I get more constipation when I'm dealing with that. Right. And it's, it's also uh, pretty individualized. Some people ironically, we'll see better regularity constipation when they go on a low FODMAP diet. Um, not all, right? But but that happens in some cases. And in some cases where there is, let's say, constipation, antimicrobial therapy will help with their regularity. Um, and my data here is a little bit antiquated. We have to go through another review on this. But from about three years ago, when we did a pretty comprehensive review of dietary fiber and colon cancer, there wasn't, and when you isolate for the healthy user effects, people who don't smoke, drink, or smoke and drink less and have healthier diets overall, when you can, when you control for those confounders, there wasn't any clear signal that higher dietary fiber intake led to more uh, colorectal cancer prevention. Certainly, I wouldn't say that that's a license to go out there and eat a highly processed diet, but I, I think what it tells us is, like many things, once you take a step outside of or, or beyond the standard American diet, many different reference diets can be health promoting. Mediterranean, paleo, low carb, uh, vegetarian, right? I think they all can be helpful. Um, and to your point, why I think this matters is some people will force upon themselves a high fiber intake and notice that they feel poor when they do it and they keep going because they think they need to do that for their health. And it comes back to what you said before, which I strongly agree with, which is listen to your body, right? That's, it's such an important sort of North star for people to follow. Yeah. When it comes to fiber intake, I think it's kind of like a bell curve, right? Where there's people that do really, really well with little to no fiber. And these are people that may be on a carnivore diet and seem to be thriving on that diet. And there's people that do really, really well with very high fiber. They're the very strong plant-based advocates, and they seem to be doing really, really well on a high fiber. Most of us are kind of more towards the middle, right? We may skew a little bit left or a little bit right, and it's kind of trying to figure that out, um, you know, customize it to, to what's going to work best for us.